Francisco Del Rio, Diego Silva. Welcome to Acquiring Minds, guys. Hi, nice to meet you. You two are doing what I'll call an entrepreneurial roll-up of veterinary practices in Chile. And I call it entrepreneurial because you're not private equity guys. You're a couple of scrappy entrepreneurs figuring this out as you go. And it's a super fun coincidence for me. My wife is Chilean from Santiago, where you all are sitting right now. And my sister-in-law is a veterinarian with a practice in Santiago. So, hola, Daniela. I wanted to make sure to give her a <laughs> shout out. <laughs> so, we have a very unlikely overlap there, and I'm excited to get into it. Francisco, I'll go to you first. Please give us some background on yourself, then Diego will go to you. Yeah, well, thanks for having us again. Uh, my background is I started engineering here in Chile. The first five years of my career, then I worked in finance-related stuff, first at a big conglomerate, doing all types of investment analysis, They're from buying bonds and stocks to buying companies. So very broad range. Then I moved to a, one of their companies and did corporate finance there for a while. After that, I went to the U.S. to get my MBA at Harvard. Uh, after the MBA, two years there, I came back to Chile. I worked for BCG, the consulting company, for uh, one year and a half almost. And after that, I moved to a, another conglomerate, a financial conglomerate, to do strategy. And in between that transition is when I decided I wanted to do something of my own. So I started thinking of ideas, you know, analyzing this and that. And then I remember some classmates of mine from Harvard did this veterinary clinic roll-up in the U.S. They have their company called Alliance Animal Health. They have around 200 hospitals at this point. So one day I just called them up, hey, tell me about this, sounds interesting. What do you do? How does it work? What do you offer to the vets? Uh, so I, after talking to them, I started investigating a little bit the landscape here in Chile. To be honest, I knew nothing about the veterinary industry, but it seemed interesting. So after a while and doing so much research, it's okay. I got to jump in the pool, as we say here. Uh, and we started looking for our first practice to buy. Uh, I, I looked for some partners, and that's a little bit of background before telling you more about Latin Bet. Great. Well, Francisco, a couple follow-up questions. First, so if these Alliance Animal Health uh, um, guys were your classmates, so this is not, uh -huh. they've rolled up 200 clinics in how long? Like what? How? When were you at Harvard? In other words, four or five years ago. I w I was at Harvard from 2016 to 2018. Okay. If I remember correctly, they started that while we were at Harvard, so they probably started in 2017. Did you have any private equity experience? You you've you've shared with us that you were doing a lot of finance stuff, but any that you would call private equity. You could say that in my first job, it was some sort of private equity because you, we did acquire companies or evaluate companies to acquire. Uh, and then in my summer internship at Harvard, I also worked at a smaller PE firm, PE firm in New York. Okay. And then just two questions more on your motivation. Francisco, you had said that, uh, I guess, going from BCG to the other company while back in Santiago is when you decided that you wanted to do something on your own, to be, do something entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. What was that decision about? Why did you make, why did you feel that? A uh, lot of personal reasons. Um, while working at BCG that, you know, is a very demanding job in terms of time and dedication, looking around, I sort of projected myself 20, 30 years uh, down the road and I felt like I wanted to spend more time with my family, a uh, family that I was creating at the moment, right? Um, and I felt like BCG didn't give you that opportunity and the only way to really uh, own your time is to have your own business, right? Of course, it's mm -hmm. going to be tough, especially at the beginning. You're going to have to put in a lot of hours, but hopefully if you make something grow then you'll be able to manage that better than if you're always working for a company. Sure. 
And did and then, people think, go ahead. Sorry. And I, I was going to add also, there's always that feeling of wanting to do something different, something new, something that, that you want to add to the, I, I guess, to your country in this, in this case, or to the local economy and create something uh, that, that ha hasn't been done at least uh, here. Mm -hmm. And did people think you were crazy to leave these great jobs to do this project? You always find a little bit of everything. Some people think you're crazy because, hey, you have a great job, great salary, great role. You know, why are you going to give all that up to start from scratch pretty much? Uh, there's always people that think like that, but there's also a lot of people that gave me great support, especially my wife. Hey, this is the moment. We don't have kids yet. If you don't do it now, it's, always, it's only going to get more difficult to do it. So this was the time to do it. Great. And then finally, the uh, of all of the entrepreneurial things you could do, start a business, start a veterinarian clinic. I mean, you weren't a veterinarian, so that's probably why you wouldn't have started that. But, but why it's did the 200 clinics, the Alliance story resonate with you so much or, or that path? Why not some other entrepreneurial venture? Yeah, good question. I I did take my time analyzing a lot of opportunities uh, in different industries, you know, different styles, let's say, roll up from scratch, etc. Uh, and this one was the one that made more sense to me in, in all the aspects I evaluated. I evaluated, you know, growth potential, uh, starting point from scratch or no, potential to get to a certain salary in one, two, three years, uh, et cetera. And, and this one, um, it's the one that added the most points to put in a way, right? It's a growing yep. industry. Um, it's a proven model, hasn't been done in Chile. So it checked a lot of the boxes for me. Great, great. Well, certainly having a model that you can look at these, these classmates of yours, having phenomenal success with 200 clinics, that would be inspiring. Um, great. Yeah. Thank you, Francisco. Diego, your turn. Yeah. Tell us about yourself, please. Thank you, Will. So um, I'm from Santiago, from Chile, as you know. And I have a bachelor degree in business and economics. Uh, for the first, I will say, seven, eight years of my career, I worked for a big corporate company, a CPG company, specifically on the wine, of course, Chilean wine, and mm -hmm. uh, spirits. <laughs> I, know, I know it well. <laughs> yeah, sure. and Pisco, Chilean Pisco exportation. So during these years, I was traveling through the world and selling wine and Pisco to supermarkets, restaurants, cocktail bars, and I know it sounds like that's the perfect job, but you want to hang out with your friends and not with random bar bartenders like and five times per night. So, but while I was doing this, selling wine and pisco, I was developing my passion and my hobby, which is dog training and dog breeding, specifically some kind of breeds, English, setter, Irish, setter, Bisla, Brittany, etc. So at what moment I decided, okay, I don't want to sell wine anymore. I just want to drink it, but not sell it anymore. So <laughs> I want to get a job on the best veterinary management company of the world. Is it in Chile? No. Is it in Latin America? No. So I had to apply for jobs in the U.S., but as you know, when you came from a, a foreign country, applying for a job is not easy. So I decided that getting an MBA from a U.S. business school was the perfect path for me to get my goal. That's why I applied to Duke. I get my MBA at Fuqua Business School. During that two years, I worked part-time, then full-time internship. Uh, and finally, I got a full-time offer at BetterBet, which is a veterinary tech located in Boston. 
And at that moment, my life was perfect. You know, like I got, I got everything I was looking for. I got the job. I was there with my wife and two of my dogs. All the family together were very happy going and moving to Boston. But at that moment, I met Francisco. He told me everything about Latin bed, what he was developing. And for me, at that moment, the first thing I thought was, oh, this guy was faster than me. So he's developing this cool thing. I'm not part of it. Because my plan was to come back to Chile in a couple of years and do it by myself, something similar. But he invited me to be part of Latin bed. So I had to decide with my wife and my two dogs, what, what should we like do now? So I quit it. Like I rejected my, 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 my job offer, uh, as piece, uh, director of business development at Better Bed. And I came back to Chile to join forces with Francisco and change the veterinary industry here in Latin America. By the way, the timing, Diego, if you had met or heard about Francisco just a few months later, you would have already accepted the offer at Better or you would already be working at Better Vet. You might not have said yes because you might have felt a commitment to stay at Better Vet or something. I mean, it seems like the window of time for you and Francisco to meet was narrow and, you, and it was right at the right moment. Yeah, or no, was, maybe you would have quit. Maybe you would have quit Better Vet whenever, no, whenever be, Francisco came. Be, Better Vet was like what was, was I was looking for. It was veterinary industry, veterinary tech. It was a startup, but the startup that has been at that moment, it, it has been growing sharply. Like the founders w were like very smart, very talented people. Like it was in Boston. I, I love Boston. So, so it was the perfect formula for my happiness or, uh, or <laughs> like I, I thought that. So mm -hmm. it was a very, very, very difficult decision because uh, as an international or international student, your goal usually is to stay in the U.S get a full-time offer so you can get a visa to work there. So, and, and that's very challenging. So like I was, I achieved that and having it in my hands and, and, and had to say, no, you need to come back to Chile, like start your business and pay for your MBA. It's like, oh, it's not a very rational decision, you know? But as I always say, like if you want to, if you want to look like do everything as people think you should do, it's just like reading a book. I think you should write your own book mm -hmm. and taking decisions that are not rational. Sometimes it, it's, 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 it's how I, I, we should live life and you could stay, but you try it. And if you success, you will say like, okay, I was right, but. Yeah, this is how I see it. And of course, my parents at the beginning were like, Diego, you have to pay your MBA. Like, I know, I know, I know, but trust me, trust me. This is an incredible idea. This is an incredible market. I really love it. This is my passion. And Francisco is the smartest guy, the smartest guy I ever met before. So it has to work. It will definitely work. Mm-hmm. Well, that was beautiful, Diego, and um, and I feel like that was a perfect. Your metaphor about writing your own book is a perfect, perfectly captures the kind of spirit of an entrepreneur. I think um, love that. So, so audience, you, you've heard them say La Latam Vet is the name of the enterprise. Um, Lat Latam Vet, great. Okay, guys, uh, Francisco. So back to you now. So you've you've t get us into the. I guess the search or the first acquisition, what is it, this plan, how does it actually start to take shape? Do you raise capital, et cetera? Yeah, perfect. Well, so as I said, I talked to my friends from Alliance Animal Health. I did my research about the industry here in Chile. Like I mentioned, I knew nothing about the veterinary industry, uh, aside from taking my dog to the vet one or two times. So I started re doing research online, sizing the market, you know, reading uh, papers, talking to the friend of the friend who, who is a veterinarian, who has a veterinary clinic to see if, if what I was thinking about doing made sense to them, if they thought that could be helpful to them. So I did my research for a while, but then there's a point you can do so much research. Then you just have to 
go and do it, right? So I said, okay, you just have to go and do it. I need to find a clinic and buy it. I just need money for that, right? So uh, I went to two friends from university, told them about this idea. They loved it. So we said, okay, let's do it. Uh, like I said before, let's jump in the pool and go buy a, a clinic. This was late 2019, very early 2020. And then, boom, the pandemic hit, right? So everyone's in lockdown, uh, very limited, at, at least at the very beginning here in Chile, uh, lockdown, uh, very limited, you know, moving around the city. But we're very excited about about this idea. And we had all this momentum from doing the research, talking to better some veterinarians. So we just kept that going. Uh, but that made it difficult because then the, the first part of our search was done via phone, right? We wanted to talk to a veterinary owner and we couldn't go to the clinic to visit it. We couldn't go have a coffee in person. So everything was done by phone. So I, at the very beginning, was like, hi, this is Francisco. I'm coming back from the US. I have this amazing idea that will help you run your practice much better. This, that, I did my MBA, so I know this is going to work. Of course, what, what you're going to think if someone's calling like that, okay, this is, you know, another Nigerian prince scam or something. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so we had a lot, a lot of, re of rejections. Uh, but then finally, just by knocking on doors, uh, we got lucky. And one of the clinics opened their doors to us. We, we had chats, you know, we started getting their trust. We, we, we did some arrangements to, to meet, you know, in one of our apartments with the owners, you know, those, you, you, at that point you had to go online and get special permits to go to a hospital, for example. Right. Uh, so we got one of those permits to go meet secretly with the owners, uh, until wow. we found this, this right, a uh, clinic that wanted to sell to us. Uh, two, it was two veterinarians. One of them wanted to leave at least, uh, keep working as a veterinarian, keep working. Uh, he's a dermatologist, but he, he was very, very tired of all the admin part. So he wanted to sell to get rid of that and work only as a specialist. So that worked perfect for us. We bought his share. The other veterinarian stayed in the clinic. Uh, and that was our first acquisition in early 2021. Francisco, when you're cold calling, what is your what is your pitch to all these to all these veterinarians? Even though it was a lot of rejection, what were you saying? Well, at, at that, well, this we have perfected that initial pitch a lot. Of course, like I said, we we got a lot of rejections. It's especially if you do it over the phone at the beginning, right? It's very difficult. But we first approach them with this idea of, okay, we're going to help you with the admin part. Uh, you know, this is, uh, we know this is, uh, difficult for you. You're going to get money and everything is going to be great for you. But at the beginning, we had to also deal a lot with more the, the trust part of, Hey, who are you? Francisco El Rio. You might have studied in the U.S., right? But the veterinary is, I don't know you. You don't have any veterinary background. No one in the industry is here about you. So we've been perfecting that a lot, uh, trying to understand what veterinarians work. It's more gain their trust. Don't go directly offering a business proposal, but sort of get to know them. Obviously, now we try to meet them in person first, go for a cup of coffee, go for a dinner. And then after that, we start building on what the business case is. That at the very beginning. Now it's a little easier because, you know, now the industry knows who we are. Uh, this consolidation mm -hmm. trend has already started. So once you approach them, they know what this is about. And the idea that you were proposing to buy their business, is that very notion that somebody would buy your small business or your practice, your veterinary practice in Chile, um, was that even something that people had heard of or was it, was it, and maybe that's why they thought it was, they thought they couldn't trust you because it was so weird. But I mean, I guess our oh. clinics transacted 
at all in Chile, even even between each other? Or was it just totally kind of like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it, it's very uncommon here that someone buys a small business. Sometimes it happens, you know, but it's sort of an internal thing. A junior veterinarian buys the clinic from the older guy who's retiring, things like that. But someone yeah. random coming from outside, knocking on your door, I want to buy your business. That's very unheard of. So as you mentioned, that was also one of the points at the beginning. And, and they come with all questions like, why, are you, why do you want to buy my clinic? This sounds weird. This might be a scam. If you buy my clinic, what am I going to do after that? That uh, yeah. Being a veterinarian is all I know. So if you buy my clinic and you push me out, what am I going to do after it? So we, we face a lot of those issues at the beginning. And what was your answer to that last question? Because if you're approaching just all veterinarian clinics, the idea that they're going to be retirement age, they're not necessarily going to be at retirement age. So they are going to have to figure out what to do after selling to you. What was your answer? Well, that's part of our model where we buy 51 to 70% stake in the clinic. We want the veterinary owner to keep a large share of the business, 30 to 40%, because that way he keeps working in what he likes. Uh, he has obviously a huge incentive to keep working and to make the clinic better, which is also a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. And it's also Great. easier for him to sell, as you mentioned, because he's going to keep having an income and he's going to keep doing what he loves. And in your first acquisition, was that what happened? No, you said, you said one of the partners left and one of the partners stayed. Um, can, can, you share, can you share kind of what the terms of that deal looked like? Yeah. So one, one left as an owner of the clinic. He kept working in the clinic as a, say, external specialist, right? Dermatologist. So he works for, for that clinic and he also works in two, three more clinics as a specialist. Uh, the other one stayed with his share. Uh, and we sort of, this was an SME before, right? So, so he decided everything. So, the terms what was we sort of formalized he working as a veterinarian, so we made an employment contract, but then everything else is lit uh, according to our shares. But but the the terms the model that you just explained, oh. where he retains a big ownership chunk, was that the model for this first acquisition as well? It was the model for this first acquisition as well, but it sort of worked naturally. Uh, that way, mm -hmm. right? Because these two veterinarians had 50% each. So we acquired once the 50% of the guy retiring, the other one kept his 50%. We gotcha. do have an agreement with him to buy an additional 10 to 20% down the road. Mm -hmm. But obviously at the very, very beginning, uh, he didn't want to be a minority owner in his own company to some unknown people. They He was the first clinic. So uh, they did take sort of a leap of faith, you know, letting us in when we were just no one in the industry. Sure, sure. And how did you, how did you do your own due diligence on this? What does it look like? Let me provide a little more context to this whole interview. You know, because you're doing this in outside the U.S., um, I just want to provide a lot of visibility into the the doing it in a market where this isn't as common. I mean, even in the US, small business owners being approached by strangers who are not private equity, but young people um, is, un, is still, it's increasingly common, but it's still kind of like a little odd. Um, but as you've said, at least in the veterinary industry in Chile, it's unheard of. And there will be a number of people listening outside the US in markets where entrepreneurship through acquisition and roll-ups are not well known or not as mature as in the U.S. So I want to just, I want, I'm kind of, I want to educate those folks on what it looks like, what what it looked like for you guys to do this. So Will? back to my question. Yes, Diego. Yeah, talk to me. Just just to give you an example, in the U.S., like for the ETS space, you have brokers, so you can buy or like do a search for companies through brokers. Here right. in Chile, you don't have any kind of broker for any kind of company. It doesn't exist. 
if you say ETA in Chile, it's like, oh, it's like the time you are arriving to a place. Like it, it's kind of a similar word, you know, it's, it's <laughs> right, made arrival right, right. time, EAT, yeah. So, right. so that, it, there's like a huge gap in between like the small and medium business acquisition mindset in the US compared to, to all the Latin American countries. So in any yeah. industry, not only the veterinary industry. Great. Okay. Well, that was kind of my, my, my prejudice, my assumption. So thank you for validating it. Um, and, and as we know here in the U S even, you know, get having the conversations with owners and asking them for their financials. I mean, it's a very fraught, high friction, delicate process. That's really what this podcast in large part is all about <laughs> is this process. So, so already it's difficult here and in a less mature environment, um, or with a less, whatever, yeah, mature, uh, as in your case, it is that much harder. So, um, and I think a lot of people listening, particularly outside the US, will, will be able to relate to what you guys were, ex are, were and are experiencing. So, Francisco, so, so, so what does it look like to get the financials, to, you know, to, to yeah, and, and do the due diligence, on, due diligence on this business? Of course, getting the financials at the beginning is an issue. As I mentioned, there's huge um, trust issues, right? Uh, so first, we work a lot, as I mentioned, in gaining their trust. We go out to dinner, we go out to coffee, we have a lot of talks with them. So by the time we ask for the financials, there's at least some trust built. Uh, also, we try to do it as professional as possible. So when the time comes, we proactively share with them an NDA. Obviously, they have no idea what, what an NDA is, but we, you know, by explaining them, hey, this is to protect, this is to protect you, this is to keep all your information confidential. This means that I cannot go and use this information to put a veterinary clinic in front of yours and compete, all that. So they feel a little safer after proactively sharing that with them. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then after getting the financials, well, my previous partners, you know, the one I, I bought this first link with, my university classmates, and I, we, we both had financial background. He had work also in corporate finance. So we did our, at least the valuation, the analysis, and all that due diligence all on our, on our own. And uh, a lot of questions with them, a lot of questions to the, you know, their accountant, things like that. But we did all that analysis. Then we did hire some boutique uh, lawyer firm to help us with more the legal part, right? See that, you know, the company was properly formed, you know, that there were no lawsuits or things like that, yeah. that they had paid their yeah. taxes. But we, we, we did replicate a lot of our corporate finance M&A experience into this uh, smaller deal. Mm -hmm. And how, what does the valuation look like? So in, in, again, in the US, we have a rough, at least in, our, in the world of ETA, we think in terms of, you know, at the low end, two to two and a half, all the way up, but call it, you know, three yeah. to four, four and, a, four and a half X of earnings is kind of, you know, the ballpark. Um, yeah. What, what, how did you even, they probably had no sense of even how to think about the value of the business themselves. So how did that conversation go? Yeah. Um, well, we, we did, we also didn't know very well, you know, how to, what the multiples were for a veterinary clinic here in Chile. The best reference we had was the U.S. no comps, what my friends had, had bought, but Obviously, a U.S. multiple it is not a you, you cannot apply it to Chile, but that was say our ceiling. Uh, so then we sort of took a random guess. Say, let's say if, if in the U.S. the multiple for vet clinics at that point was say six times in Chile, maybe it's three to four. So so we just took a guess with three to four. We tried to go a little above. Uh, what the minimum, uh, what, what we really wanted to pay because 
we prefer at that point we said we we want to keep talking we don't want uh, them to get offended by our proposal so let's go a little over what we want to pay to be sure you know this is going to be one clinic it's, it's something we can compensate in the future also um but then, as you say, on their side, they have no idea what their value is in general. But this case was very particular because, as I mentioned, these were two partners. One of them wanted to leave. So they had already agreed on a price between them. The mm. guy that stayed mm. was going to initially buy his partner's stake. But then we came, right, with a larger offer. So this guy is... Okay, either you pay me what they want to pay me, or I will sell to them. So, mm -hmm. uh, we in this case they they sort of had a price which which was much much lower than what we wanted to pay. Uh, but it was a good learning experience for the future cases. That the usually now they are a little more sophisticated. They hire some external consultant to help them with the valuation in some few cases. Uh, but as we mentioned briefly before the, po the podcast, these, these type of business owners add a lot of emotional value to their business. And, and that makes the conversation very difficult because on one side you have us talking very rational financial valuations. And on the other side, you have someone that's putting value on, I don't know, 20 or 30 years of work and this and that, you know. So yeah. having to terms is, is very difficult. Yeah, yeah. On, on that situation, when somebody tell us, okay, I think my practice worth, let's say, a thousand, and according to our DCA and multiple analysis is uh, 500, uh, and they say no, because the sentimental value it has to me, we we always say to them like, okay, what happens if you go to buy a new car and the owner of the car tells you that the car worth like 30% more because it was his first car? Would you pay more? Do you think it's, it, it's a correct price? And they say, <laughs> of course not. Well, it's the same for your hospital. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> uh, okay. Excellent. So... Let's let I want to make sure we get Diego here. We're we're getting to where you enter the story here, Diego, but we still got a little bit more to go on this first acquisition. Francisco, tell us so you've you've anything more to say about the transaction itself because I want to hear about what it is like as operator. Uh No, I would say at least for the first transaction I I think we got lucky. There's always a little bit of luck I feel in in all of this uh, situations. And I think we got lucky. We had a difficult time getting to this first clinic that opened up their doors, you know, and welcomed us and was willing to negotiate with us. But after that, I would say the negotiation was pretty easy going. They already had a number, our number was higher. So there wasn't much negotiation on the value. Uh, everything was pretty smooth. Uh, so I guess we had a a little bit of luck uh, factor in, in this first acquisition. And if you bought it in cash, you and you had these two other partners, not Diego at the time, you guys pooled your resources and bought it in cash? Or did you take, did you somehow, are there bank loans to finance this sort of thing in Chile? So we put 50% cash, our savings, and then 50% it was three of us who bought this first clinic. We went and get personal loans. Uh, at least in Chile, I imagine similar in other countries outside the U.S. If you want to get a loan for a for a company, you know, Latambet, who was created a month ago and has no track record at all, banks here don't loan you money for that. So we had to go and get personal loans that will then lend to the company to make this first acquisition. But when the bank is loaning you this money, they're asking you, what are you going to use it for, right? They're asking me what I'm going to use it for. So I tell them I'm going to use it to buy a veterinary clinic. But 
they they really don't care. They care that I, I'm the the final guarantor, the guarantor, guarantor of of that of that loan. Yeah, yeah. And I assume it is a guarantor. There's a kind of the the what we would call in the U.S. a personal guarantee. So obviously, yeah, I mean, to, it's, it's a personal loan. So they're going to come after yeah. your, your assets if you don't pay it back. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now you buy this business. You've you've, as I recall from the pre-call, you and your two then partners are keeping your jobs. Mm -hmm. So tell us about tell us about what happens then as owners now of this new, of this business. Well, that that was uh, I'd say ups and downs for for a period, you know, one to two years because we kept our jobs. We had this on the side. It was sort of a pilot, right? Test run to see if the veterinary industry made sense in what we had learned from the US. We could apply it here in Chile, all, all that. So we we did work a lot of extra hours, let's say, to keep this going. So we had our nine to not even five, right? Because everyone was working in consulting, BCG, stuff like that. So we had our nine to nine jobs. And then after that, we would go see the clinic we go we would meet with the there's there's like an admin person in the in the hospital right so we would meet with him to see numbers to see how things are working hey let's try this let's try that this isn't working so we did a lot of a lot of extra hours to put in away late nights weekends etc to try to keep this working i say lots of ups and downs because Obviously, we couldn't dedicate as much time as we wanted. So that also brought us some, I'd say, discussions with the, with our veterinary partner because we went there right promising, hey, we're coming from the U.S. We want to replicate this model. We're going to help you with this, with that. Your clinic is going to grow. But that at the beginning, at least, right, with the first clinic and dedicating only partial time was very, very, very slow to pick up, at least at the beginning. Um, so that brought us discussions. Uh, we had to explain to him the situation. Uh, in, the, in the long run, it worked, you know, in, after two years, sales grew, EBITDA grew. Uh, we did some improvements. Uh, we took care of admin stuff that the veterinary owner didn't want to take care of. So we took some load off his back. But it was a very slow start doing it on the site. So uh, it was constantly trying to look for a way also to do this full time, you know. But that that's sort of the um, having a full time job and trying to go do this full time, sort of from scratch, uh, leaving the salary and all that is difficult. So we are trying to constantly raise capital on the side, but it was the pandemic again. So raising capital for a business when half the country is in lockdown was very, very difficult. So we had to survive in this situation for around two years before we were able to raise to, before I would met Diego, had a partner who was willing to do this full time with me because the other two guys had some personal reasons not to do this full time, and before we could raise money from investors. Okay, so so the, so those first two years were a little bit slow going because you guys are, the three of you are in your jobs. Uh, the owner is a little frustrated with you because the the value proposition has been we're going to come in and bring all these business best practices and make your clinic more profitable, more efficient happens slower than he wanted, but it does eventually happen. Mm -hmm. During these two years, it's still pandemic time and raising capital therefore was going to be hard that, and, and, and you would have, you needed to raise capital to be able to devote, to quit the job. So there's a bit of a, a bit of a uh, catch 22 there. Uh -huh. um, also, it might've been difficult to raise capital because you bought one, but you hadn't yet made improvements. So if you went to a capital provider and said, we're going to do this 10 more times, they'd say, well, you haven't even demonstrated that it works the first time yet. <laughs> so, exactly. exactly. Um, okay. Well, um, but it does work. It just takes a little bit longer. So, so let's, get, let's bring in Diego here. So the, your two other partners decide not to proceed. 
I know it's you don't want to speak for them, but can you can you maybe say anything about that? Was it like that they just didn't think that this was they lost faith and you continued having faith in the plan or can you say anything? Yeah, no, I'd say it's more personal reasons, right? One of them wanted to go on to the U.S. and study. Uh, so he went to the U.S. and did his his MBA program, as I had done a few years back. So he had that interest before doing this full-time. He, he was considering it, but he wanted to do that first. And then the other partner likes the business, thinks there's potential, but he has more personal reasons. He... He had four kids. He has four kids at that at the time. So, you know, I'm considering doing this full time because I have a full time job with a salary. This guy has exactly the same situation, but with four kids to take care Oof. of, right? So, making that decision is hard, right? And I, I totally understand that. So, it wasn't like an issue. It wasn't a discussion. It was very valid reasons, if you ask me. But then on my side, it's like, okay, I still need someone to do this with because I cannot do it alone, right? Great. And so how, how, how do you guys connect? I don't think that we got that. Maybe we did, remind me. It's kind of in some way funny. While I was working at Vetervet, at some point I was stuck with kind of a tech issue I wanted to solve for my team. So I contacted a very smart friend who was studying at Stanford to ask, ask for him advice, for his for, for advice. And he told me, hey, Diego, you should meet another guy that's studying in Stanford that has a veterinary business in Chile. And I was like, oh, who's that guy? And he connected me with that guy who was the Francisco's friend, who one of the three guys. Ah. So, so I talked with him and he said, you should talk with my partner, Francisco. And that's why I was connected with Francisco. Great. And Francisco, you were looking for a partner. What was your pitch to Diego, who had just got his dream job? By the way, Diego, I have to congratulate you on, on deciding you wanted to be in an industry, figuring out how you were going to break into that industry without yet being a veterinarian, applying to business school in the US, which itself is a year long process, getting into a great business school, going, then getting a great job. I mean, it's really, you really are a long-term planner and, and you, really, you really did it. And then having the balls, excuse my bad language, to leave that, leave the dream that you'd made happen for yourself over four long years or longer and do this other adventure. It's really, really admirable. I digress. So, so Francisco, what was your pitch to Diego? How did you, how did you peel him away from his his uh, the dream that he just started to enjoy? <laughs> yeah. Well, more than looking for a partner, just to clarify, I was trying to make this work, right? So we're looking for potential investors. I was ah. willing to do this full time, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But always thinking, well, doing this with a partner is always better than doing it alone, right? So I always had that in the back of my, of my mind. And then one day I get the call from this random guy, right? Hey, I'm living in the US. I like the veterinary business. I want to see what you're doing. So I talked to him. He told me all this background we just, <laughs> we recently heard. And I said, this is the guy I need, right? This is the perfect complement to, to what I'm looking, to what I need, to what I'm looking for. I, I'm more of a financial guy, very engineering stereotype, you know, with square-minded, as we say here, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, and this, like, dog lover, he's working in something similar in the U.S., extroverted, you know. This is, this is the, the person I need. Uh, so I... He he what he told me he he was thinking about doing this potentially in the future. So, you know, I took the two, three things that I thought could resonate with him. And I did try to present it at, as hey, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for you. I didn't tell him that, of course, at the at that time. I just tried to show it as hey, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Come here, we're gonna work this together. Uh 
I just barely got started, so we're going to grow this together. Let me know if this resonates with you sometime in the future. Uh, and I guess, um, I, again, lucky coincidence, uh, it worked out. How long did it take you to d get back to, to Francisco, Diego, and say yes? I would say, like, the final, the final decision was around two to three months after our first mm. conversation. But mm -hmm. I, did, I did my personal due diligence on Francisco, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had to how do, do you do? How do you diligence a future partner? This is a great question, actually. Yeah. Just to find like mutual connections and yeah. ask them what do they think about Francisco. Yeah. That's I the guess, only way I because he, you I guess can... he passed the test. Because you can read a CV and his CV is like, and you know about it, it's incredible. But a co-founder is like getting married. Yes. It's, it's, it's more deep, like it's oh, deeper yes. than, oh, sure. than a CV. So asking a few people, uh, that know him from high school, uh, like a girl that dated, dated him <laughs> too, uh, the best friend of my wife, and everybody <laughs> said incredible <laughs> things about him. So it was like, okay, I, there is the, the idea, it, it's, it's working, they have one hospital, and the guy is like, it's not only very smart, but also like very, a very good person, which for me is, is, is very, very important. So should I like take the risk or should I wait? And my wife was like a key element on this decision because she studied in, in the US too. He did a master at the engineering school at Duke. So our plan was to stay in the US we both worked in together, not in the same company, but, but, but in, in the US. So she was a massive help. And she told me, I know it's risky. I don't have like the guts to do it, but I know you have it. And this is what you love. This is what you're looking for. You have my su support. If it works, cool. If it doesn't work, it's fine. Like, the worst case is scenario is like you will need at, at that situation, you will have to look for a job and it's the same thing you're, you have been doing the last few years. So mm. it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And by the way, personal diligence, talking to the ex of somebody, that is a great oh, tip it's not for the audience. In Chile, <laughs> I just want to clarify because if, if, if Kata Francisco, wife, Francisco's wife is listening to this, I was, it's not an ex. It's just a girl he dated a couple of times, not an ex-girlfriend. Okay. Just so okay. clarify okay. that, Francisco. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Great, guys. So you decide to hook up it, what does we we're not going to have time to go through the subsequent four acquisitions you've done five um maybe pick one of the five to tell us about what what was maybe the the most educational one of the next four was it the second one or was it a later one oh great question i would say one of the later ones uh because one of the later ones is where we, we had to go through, let's say, the full process of convincing someone to sell. As I mentioned, the first clinic, they sort of op they opened their doors to us, but one of the guys already wanted to sell to his partner, right? So we're, they were sort of in that mood. They, we had to convince them we were the right choice, but they were already in a, what the, the selling guy was already in that mood. Versus the three others, it was more of a cold call. Someone ha that hasn't thought about selling, someone that hasn't thought about having a partner, you have to convince them about selling and, and, and having a partner. After that, you have to convince them that the right person to sell to is you, right? So we had to go through that full process uh, with, with those. And I, I uh, and particularly in one of those, uh, we also had to compete against another, uh, consolidation company here in Chile. So we, we also had, you know, competing bids and offers. Uh, oh, this guy is telling me this, this guy is offering me that. So I would say that's the, the most, uh, important or, 
relevant acquisition to challenge today. challenging one i would say challenging yeah and did you did you win because you offered more money it's not no. it's not only about it's not only about money will it at some point when you connect with the people you are looking to partner with like that's what like generate a difference in any kind of negotiation because of course a person it's 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 the same analogy with like looking for a co-founder they are looking for 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 partners because they are still in like they're still being like owners of their veterinary practices so you can offer them more money but also and from my point of view what makes the difference is sharing with them the values your company has what's like your plan for the future who who is latin bet who is francisco who is diego we are not a private equity we are not a fund we are latin bet we are different and we have a plan we are here to make a change in the veterinary industry and we want to invite you to be part of us you as a as an owner of a hospital but also we want you to include to include like your experience your leadership in latin bet too and and for him and um, his name is Jorge by the way he's a Jorge. great person pretty smart pretty straightforward and i just want to say that like like sharing all of this make made sense to him to join us and it worked mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to complement what what diego said i think it's very important this is going to sound maybe very cliche and what you read in like every negotiation book, but to understand what the other person wants, what their, what their real interests are. Of course, if you go buy someone and offer 3x more money than the competition, you're probably going to buy that, right? But if you buy something at 3x your competition, it's probably not going to be profitable, right? So when you're dealing in I mean, you're competing by price, but after that, you want to make this attractive to him in all the other interests those that person has. Maybe that person wants to retire. Maybe that person wants to build a house in the beach. But maybe that person wants to keep working as a specialist, like our first acquisition. Maybe that person wants to be part of a bigger challenge, as the case with uh, Jorge. He he wanted he he ha, he's a veterinarian, but he has a business mindset. He he likes challenges. He likes creating new things. Uh, he likes learning. He likes being in an entrepreneurial environment. So we offer him that. We offer offer him to be a part of Latin Bed to help us build Latin Bed, not just be someone running a hospital. So learning the the real interest of the of the people help a lot in making that difference. Francisco, you say it's a cliche, it's, it's negotiation 101, and I agree with you, but that point that you make does not come up with my guests very often. A, a recent guest, uh, Scott, brought it up, um, but it's such a good point, and it's so easy to forget, as basic as it is, to, um, and, and part, of, pro, part of that is probably my fault, because I just, I, I jump to, often with my guests, what did they pay? So in my, in my listeners' minds, I'm reinforcing that, you know, what do you pay? What do you pay? What's the multiple you get? And, and it, it's, it should be much more nuanced than that. You really should understand another cliche, the why behind why somebody is selling. Um, exactly. and, 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 and you can ask them. You can just ask them. And, it, and it's so much um, more effective than not <laughs> asking them. Um, and, and, yeah. and the, because the good news is you can offer de often deliver it. It's often not more money. It's often something that you can give to them. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm really glad you brought it up. Diego, yeah. what were you going to say? Yeah, yeah. I want to say two things. The first one is there is like a typical question I usually ask, ask to them. And is what's your dream? What's your dream? Tell me what are you like? Perfect scenario. What's your dream? What are you dreaming about your business, your life? Because if you understand that, you are able to make, like, to create a proposal, like, um, I can proposal. say, it. yeah, a proposal that's suitable for, for what the person's looking for. 
this, the expectations of this person are aligned with what you are offering. And, 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 and for us, I think that's, that's a, a very important part of, of, our, of, of Latin bit. And, and the other thing I wanted to say, if you want to just to wrap up this, this, this part of the conversation, what we are doing, we are not acquiring business. We are, we are acquiring minds. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Diego, that was great. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, let's let's do wrap up the acquisitions a little bit, and let's hear about some of the operational improvements. So, um, because I think those will be um, valuable, to, maybe to people outside of the of the of the vet world. What are when you go into a clinic? And you see opportunity there. What what are where is what is the typical opportunity? The operational improvements you can make, the quick wins. Yeah, I mean the typical quick wins you can make are related first of all with I would say the way how they manage their information, the data. Usually, veterinary hospitals here in Chile don't use um, a suitable veterinary management software. So all the data they have it at an Excel or just like over a paper. So we start working with our own veterinary or CRM software to start collecting yeah. all the data about like, not only about the pets, but also about uh, supplies, about uh, KPIs, etc. So that's the first thing. And clients, uh, of course. Of course, and clients too. So just to give you an idea, now if you go to a veterinary hospital, usually you need to keep all the sheets about or related, or your medical records are on sheets. They're not digital. So changing that, it's like a, it's, it, it's definitely one of our most important quick wins. And having that yet then, the second one, of course, is economies of scales. We negotiated with the, most important suppliers and distributors from Chile. So we have a special prices. Uh, so each clinic that start working with us, they have a special like, like better prices for not only for, for, for surgery supplies, but also for, for pet shops or, 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 or any kind of pills that, that any, any pet needs. Uh, in addition, um, we focus a lot on the teams. So we implement employee benefits since the first day of our partnership. Currently, they are small, these are all small companies. So they don't have any kind of employee benefits like, uh, it, like insurance or discounts, uh, like mental health and kind of uh, health programs, etc. So we have our own Latin bed employee benefits plan that we implement on each of the hospitals. Um, I would say, oh, of course, inventory. Yeah, that's an important one. Uh, they don't, or hospitals usually don't have an, uh, like an organized um, inventory management system. They don't use a fight for life for, not at all, nothing, nothing related with that. They just buy according to like their gut feeling. So just making some arrangements in the way how they physically like manage all the inventory and then how they put all of these on like on a data, data set, then it allows us to start at like buying all this inventory with like diminishing all kind of the, um, I said, um, uh, you don't say caducation, you said, Francisco? Um, expiration. Expiration, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. You reduce almost to zero the expiration rate of all the supplies the, 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 the hospital acquired. Mm -hmm. I would mention two more. Uh, one sounds very simple, but it's creating KPIs and displaying them in some sort of Power BI panel or something. You know, the, the veterinarians running these businesses now, they're just worried about, you know, uh, doing their surgeries and seeing dogs and all that. But they don't, they're not worried about looking at the business from 
let's say from above, right? Uh, so by creating this very simple panel with some KPIs, you instant, instantly change their mindset to analyzing this as a business, you know, that, that, that has lots of moving parts. Uh, that sounds very simple, but has a, a big impact. And the second one, I would say, is variable compensation. Uh, something, and I would say there, there are two groups here. Many of them don't have variable compensation at all. So obviously introducing var variable compensation is always a way to move people or to do more, to push further. And other group, when you tell them about implementing variable compensation schemes, they say, oh, I tried that. It doesn't work. But variable compensation, if you ask me, is not as simple as it sounds because the variable compensation right, has to be an amount that moves you. And sometimes the, the variable compensation they, they offer is very little. Sometimes it's very complicated and it has a lot of issues. Diego worked a lot in the related to sales, right? So we brought those big corporate uh, comp variable compensation models to here and they proved uh, very, very efficient and brought results very quickly. Can you give us just one example, Francisco, of a, of a, of a variable compensation model or the KPI that it's tied to or the employee group that it's targeted at, just, just to give us a concrete yeah. example. Uh, so what we were reviewing today, actually, it's so the people in charge, what, once a client goes to a veterinary clinic, right, they, they go see the doctor. So the doctor says, okay, this is the procedure or the surgery you have to do. And at least in Chile, how it works is they give you sort of a, a proposal, right? This this is the procedure you should do. This is how much it's going to cost. Kind, blah, kind blah, of blah, a blah, budget. Blah. Yeah, the, okay. the surgery budget kind of, right? Uh, but then there's an issue trying to convert that into the client actually doing that with you, doing it and doing it with you. Because they say, ah, it's so expensive. I'm going to do it somewhere else. Or... No, you know, what my dog has isn't very urgent, so I'm just going to postpone it, right? So we focus a lot on that conversion rate. And, and the, the people in charge of doing that conversion are the, the receptionists of the, of, the, of the clinic. So we gave them a uh, compensation based on this. And in, in three months... After implementing this program, they improved the approval rate by 40%. Wow. Huge. Yeah. And one, one important Huge. thing is like you need to give a variable incentive, and, but also you need to give them the tools to achieve that incentive, to achieve that goal. So at, like at, uh, just talking about the, the situation Francis, Francisco mentioned, what we did is like we cre created like a like a protocol about what should you say, how, like, it's like a conversation, like a chat, like a situation where they speak with a client, like through phone and what should they tell them and to achieve the goal of approving the budget. So it's like client, hello, like receptionist, hi, my name is Diego. I'm calling you from Latin, from Latin bed. I'm calling you because I want you to to ask you how is your dog doing, and then good, bad, and then you continue and said like if the person says it's not interesting, it's interested, ask them why, and if the reason is because it's too expensive, then go to page two where we have all the discounts available for this kind of situation. So you need to train them to achieve the goal you are trying to to like achieve. And it has been working pretty well. Sales scripts, man. That's um, that that's you learn something out there pounding the pavement, selling uh, pisco to bartenders <laughs> around the world, Diego. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm struck, guys, that I I'm trying to um, figure out here what's what's so different about doing this in Chile versus the U.S. Because a lot of what you described. Um, Getting you know, getting rid of the paper and putting in a CRM and tracking data and business best practices like 
um, like commission sales or variable compensation. This is, I mean, you could, th that could be a small business in the US. There's no different. I mean, that pattern appears again and again and again on this podcast uh, in the US and everywhere else. Um, so it's really not that that differentiates doing this in Chile. Um, so I, 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 guess, I guess the things that make it different for you guys is there's more friction talking to sellers because it's newer to them. That's different. Mm -hmm. You're, um, it's a, probably a better, it's probably a, a greener field, a more open opportunity because there aren't people doing this in Chile. So, so if you can figure out the formula, the upside is probably bigger. Um, you know, uh -huh. you can kind of grab the market. You mentioned competition earlier. I want to make sure we talk about it. It's not, it's not, you're not the only guys doing this now. Um, and then, and then the other thing probably would be access to capital. We should, we should talk about that. Now I'm having to rewind our, your story a little bit. How are you financing all of this? And, and, and Francisco, start us with, you know, how did you resolve the problem of being able to afford finally quitting your job and going all in to do this? Well, so financing is a big issue. As I mentioned, the first we acquired with personal funds, but then Fundraising to say formally create a company dedicating to this full time, that was a long time. Uh, and of course, you have to make sacrifices, but you're always uh, trying to minimize those sacrifices, right? Uh, so we did get some, uh, some outside investors uh, early this late. 2023, early 2024, which allowed us to do this full time. I, I did take a big uh, salary cut compared to what I did before. But you know, you're, you're hoping to make a huge business that's gonna, you're gonna get, say, compensated for that in the future. I did take a salary cut. Uh, and I, 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 if you ask me now, I probably should have done that earlier, right? Uh, Sometimes trying to play two saves, you just waste time. We could have done it this earlier. Um, but we did, we did get investors and, and we're constantly talking to investors, right? This is a, a business where you're constantly buying new businesses. So you constantly need capital. Uh, so you're going to constantly need to raise equity. So we're constantly uh, talking to, different investors, pitching this to them. Uh, but that access here, I would say, is one of the main differences with Chile. You obviously have a smaller investor base. Uh, they're willing to take less risks, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's difficult. And the, the debt part is also more difficult because getting debt based on cash flow here is very, very, very difficult. Practically, pr practically, it doesn't exist. So you're sort of in a right egg chicken kind of situation because you need money to grow, but then you need size to get someone to lend you money. So it, it's you're constantly doing this, right? So you go to an investor to give you money, but then you're going to get diluted. So you want to get debt, but no one's going to give you debt. So you need to grow the business. So you're, you're constantly moving in that loop. And I'd say that's probably the biggest challenge here. I want to add something to yeah. Francisco. Um, one of the things uh, we did to diminish this risk or the risk of this kind of egg chicken situation is to establish our company in the US. So oh. Matambet, yeah, it's a C Corp uh, located in Delaware. So the reason of doing that is because we want to be open for American and other international investors to invest in Latambet. As, as, as I think I, I mentioned to you, I'm not sure, but one of our investors is the partner of a private equity from Chicago. So one of the main reasons, the main reason why we 
created or where we established our Circ Corp there was because we wanted him to be part of Latin Bay. And now, as we see, this is this is a great opportunity not to look for like potential investors in Chile or in Latin America, but but also worldwide. Fantastic. And, Go ahead, Francisco. So um, you know, earlier we talked on how acquiring SMEs here in Chile or outside the US, it's not very well known. So it's difficult to go knock on someone's door and tell them, hey, I want to buy your business, right? On the other hand, I'd say it's a little similar with investors, right? Investors here are not used to these kind of businesses on their side, and they're used to more, let's say, traditional investing. You know, the, the stock market, PE funds, things like that. So if you go pitch them, hey, I'm going to do this sur search fund, I'm going to do this entrepreneurial acquisition business model, they haven't heard it very often as well. So you also have to convince them on this sort of new business model, on this new investment model and investment strategy. So it's sort of a similar challenge on the other yeah. uh, side of the table. Yeah. Well, guys, th this is one of those things, though, where when you're the first mover, uh, it is much more difficult. But later, you emerge as the leader. I mean, you guys will be big names in Chile in 10 years as some of the earliest consolidators in the country. Um, and, and search fund ETA people coming up behind you who are, you know, 15 years old now will come knocking on your door mm -hmm. and you'll have, you'll have relationships with the institutional capital in Chile. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you, long term, if you're successful, you will be rewarded for the, for the kind of creating a market here, really. So it's pretty exciting. Great, guys. Um, what the owners of the clinics are doing is what we call in this model, they're rolling equity, right? So they're, they're retaining 40% or whatever it is of their businesses and rolling that into uh, the, uh, the pro rata share of LATAM, um, LATAM vet. So, but to typically the promise there by a PE shop, let's say doing this, is a, you know, the quote unquote second bite of the apple, that there will be another exit event for these owners where they'll be able to monetize that ownership that they retained, that they rolled. Um, mm -hmm. So you've got these owners who are essentially invest investing in LatamVet. You've got the capital providers who are obviously and explicitly investing in it. Um, so, so. What is the grand vision here? Is it exiting in five to seven years like every playbook? Or is it something longer term? And if it's longer term, how are you going to provide all of these folks who have invested in you liquidity? Yeah, good, good question. So I'd say it's both, both of those situations in a way. So we're creating a business uh, that we, when we first started doing this with Diego, we had this conversation. Hey, why, what kind of business do we want to build? Do we want to build something that is going to last three, four, or five years and then we're going to exit or no? And we decided we wanted to build something that we could work for in the next 20, 30, 40 years, right? Uh, so we're building a business that's financially sustainable. We're building a business that we think is adding value in general terms to the economy, creating something new, et cetera. And we're creating a business that we think it's fun to work for and that we can create new things in the future, right? So that adds to sort of creating a business that's going to be there for the long term. Of course, as you mentioned, then you have the issue of, well, what are you going to do with investors? That sounds very nice for you as uh, the operators, but the investors want their money back, right? So uh, in our pitch to them, we, we sort of told them this, the same story, right? So we're going we're gonna to build something in the next 
three to five years. That's going to be big. It's going to be profitable. That's going to be efficient. In, if in the next five years, say the, a PE fund from the US, uh, I know, Middle Eastern fund, you know, from Abu Dhabi comes <laughs> or wants to buy you. Of course, no one, no one's going to be, you know, stupid. And, and if they offer you a ton of money, then okay, you're going to sell it and then you're going to build something later on. But uh, at least here in Chile, also investors do have, I'd say, uh, pref a, a preference. Uh, for businesses that are cash flow generators in the long term, mm. right? Uh, that's nice. See, that's a great. That's a that is not. Uh, I would say the culture of investors, private equity investors here. Everyone's always looking for an exit. Yeah, it, in P is the case, but the, we went. Our investors are mostly family offices, mm -hmm. and the family office obviously wants to make a return, but they don't have an, uh, an urge to exit the business, right? Mm -hmm. A family office has more of a long-term view. So in if in five years you sell and get a huge chunk of money, amazing. But if you're getting you know, nice dividends every year, that also works for them. So mm -hmm. it, it's very important to your initial question to obviously focus on who your investors are going to be, right? Because if you have someone pushing you all the time to sell, 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 uh, you know, might not get the best deal you want. Also, also when when you like create a company just thinking about the exit, sometimes you put a deadline. And when you have a deadline, you stop innovating and you stop adding value for to the industry. So from from our pers perspective, or what we dream about is to change the veterinary industry in a positive way, improve the, of course, the veterinary medicine, giving more uh, investment, uh, try to help the veterinarians to study abroad or, or to work with universities, uh, improve, of course, customer experience and help the industry at all because as we see, as as we see, it's like okay, let's sell this in five years. So I need to increase my revenue sharply, cut cost very fast. I don't care about the service because I need a fast result. But if you do that, sometimes the quality of the service decreases. So and, and there are some results, like some kind of like examples of this in in the U.S. So our vision is to create value and all the time trying to improve the medicine and the customer experience. And so to be clear then, guys, you uh, where some of your investor capital came from was family offices in Chile, or were you saying that that's the culture yeah. of family office? Yeah, okay, okay. Both, and I will say uh, both. It's the yeah. culture and it's uh, many of our investors. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it's fair to generalize that point beyond Chile as well, that, that family offices in the U.S. as well are more long-term oriented. They're not, um, they're not always thinking in five and eight-year funds. Um, I think that's a fair generalization. I hope I'm not wrong there. Okay, guys, tell me a little bit about the difference between knocking on those doors or calling for the first acquisition and how hard that was. and once you were in the game, once you were actually owners of, of a clinic, did it become a lot easier? And so, so if it was the second acquisition, it must have been, those conversations must have been a lot easier because you have real credibility at that point. Tell us about that and then tell us about what it's like now. Now you probably have a lot of inbound. People are coming to you wanting to sell. Uh, yeah, I'd say in general terms, it is, as you mentioned, of course, the first one is very difficult. No one knows you. The second one is a little easier. The third one a little easier than the second one, and so on, right? Uh, it's still sort of a new thing. So uh, we still have to convince a lot of people to sell. You know, it's only like this, this last year, a couple of months, 
this has become sort of a more well-known thing in the industry. Uh, so, I mean, we do have a, still a lot of those difficult conversations. Uh, definitely easier than the first one, though, and when obviously no one knew who we were. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, but, but, now, it, but it's not it's, it ain't, it's not easy yet. People aren't coming to you yet. Just you're you're not just more deals than you well, can I, handle. It's not like that. <laughs> I, 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 we well, we do have more deals than we can handle more in the negotiation phase. Uh, mm. But now I would say that the difficult part is more. It's convincing them to sell to sell, right? Because they never heard that before. Now. Because they know we're doing this and because they know there's a new competitor in the industry. Now the conversation is, di is different. Now you have to convince them to sell to you, right? Rather than yeah. the other guy. Sure. We have been doing a, 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 a strong brand, brand awareness work during the last year. Because, of course, that acquiring more hospitals give you more credibility to acquire the next one. But it's not only that you need to like get into the industry to meet like the people, the, the leaders and, and do, and, and, and to start like not only talking with them, if you want to acquire the hospital, you want to talk with them, to know them. And, and, and that's why we started working with some, uh, veterinarians to help us. Uh, to reach new, 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 new veterinarians, and that's why we have been participating in some conferences, veterinary conferences, and going there, sharing with the people, and that has been like boosting our brand awareness, uh, not only as I get people who acquire hospitals, but also like meeting in person, sharing with them. And just in some way, making friends too, because not only you need to meet people because you want to acquire their hospital, you can also meet great veterinarians that don't want to sell, but have incredible people and they can teach you a lot of things too. Guys, the, so Chile for the audience is a, is a country of, I think you said 18 million. Yeah. And it's a country where um, the capital, Santiago, is... You know, unlike the U.S., where it's kind of multipolar and there are a bunch of big, big cities and centers of gravity, Santiago is it, and everything is a, is well below that. So, it, so all of that to say, it would seem like you could establish awareness for Latam Vet across the entire industry very quickly. I mean, it's just how many vets in Santiago are there? You know, how many how many clinics are there? A uh, hundred max. Um, so it seems like you could, yeah, it, it, it would seem like in smaller countries, you could establish awareness for what you're doing quite quickly. Or am I wrong? Oh, you're, you're very right. Chile has around 2,000 veterinary clinics. Ah, okay. So a thousand in, in Santiago or more than probably. Yeah, kind of a thousand in Santiago, a thousand in the rest of the country. <clears throat> but still... Okay a lot smaller than the US, right? Or Europe. So you can you can definitely build a brand awareness fairly quick, right? Which is what we've been doing this year, as Diego mentioned, and going to seminars, you know, and conferences and visiting thought leaders and things like that. Great. Um all right, guys. Well, let's start wrapping up here, but let's return now to not the vision because you've already shared. Well, you've shared you've shared kind of the vision in terms of short term, medium term, and long term. That 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 um, there is a long term vision here, and you've tried to ally yourself with capital and and clinics who understand that. But let's talk size. Um, so you just told us two thousand clinics in Chile. And you've acquired, I'm using clinic and hospital interchangeably. Do yep. you guys use those yep. words? Yeah. Okay. Um, you've acquired five. So in Chile alone, in Santiago alone, in Las Condes alone, you could, you could 10x maybe your current portfolio. Um, so there is a very high ceiling here. 
um, what realistically is and 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 just to use as a benchmark, we have your 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 buddies um, Francisco at Alliance who've done two hundred clinics in over seven years in a much bigger market, the U.S. So there's a lot of room to grow here. There's a whole lot of room to grow here for you guys. And oh, and then of the, course, notice the in, cl- in case the audience hadn't noticed, your brand is not Chile Vet; it's Latam Vet. So you are thinking about this as a continental play, not just Chile. Uh, yeah. Respond to all of that, please. Yes, we we definitely are thinking big leagues from the beginning. That's why we call it Latin Bet, as you mentioned. Uh, typical, well, at least for a Chilean-based business, typical growth path is, is then expanding to Peru, Colombia, and Mexico which are, the, say, the main countries in Spanish-speaking Latin, you know, Brazil, it's Portuguese, so it's always considered a little different, right? So we always... Are you, are you intentionally neglecting your neighbor to the, to, the, to the east that has, like, 45 million people? Argentina? No? <laughs> Argentina is a, is a special case, right? Uh, <laughs> have you heard about that, that, that saying that uh, there's there's four type four types of economies in the world, right? Uh, developed economies, developing economies, Japan and Argentina, right? Yeah. So totally. uh, you always are looking to 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 Argentina, but they're going through their whole of particular course, yeah. situation right now, right? So uh, at a hundred percent. In annual inflation, inflation. yeah, you know it doesn't make much sense bringing outside money. That is kind of a a, a path that that other that to follow uh, out of Chile, most, Peru, yeah. Colombia, Mexico. Yeah, Peru and Colombia. Most Chilean companies go to Peru and Colombia, and then if you want to make the bigger jump, you go to Mexico, uh, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. a huge country, right? So. If you want to go to Mexico, you have to do it, you know, big time. Big. You have to put yeah. resources into it. Yeah. Uh, so that's what we're thinking. And in terms of size, we're thinking at least a uh, hundred clinics between all of those, uh, Chile, Peru, and Colombia. We've identified, starting in Chile, of course, what are the, say, neighborhoods, comuna, uh, sort of neighborhoods, or cities, mm-hmm. right? Uh, municipalities, I guess. The, the mm-hmm. 30 municipalities where we want to be in Chile. And that, and we can have one to three hospitals in each of those. So that brings us to say 50. And then we can do another 50 between the other two countries, Peru and Colombia. And the comunas that you're targeting in Chile are all in Santiago? No, no. It's half and half. So it's most of the comunas in Santiago, not all of them, but most of them, and then the larger cities uh, around the country. And the the hundred clinics across the three countries, Peru, Colombia, Chile, over what time frame? Five years. Five years. Did you say that? I missed that. Okay. Just, yeah. to, yeah. just to give you an idea, our, our plan is to have at least 15 hospitals at the end of the next year. Oh, 15 by this time next year or in about 14 months. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. exactly. Okay. So then obviously your pace of acquisition is accelerating. Something's going, something's going well. Uh, yeah. That, it's, that, it's, that's it's, the it's, plan, right? Yeah. I mean, it, for there's some things that usually people think that w- when you acquire a hospital, you are kind of impro- like, kind of improvising it, but it, it's not our case. We have our own structure. We created our own personal CRM where we have all the hospitals in Chile with all the, 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 like, the available data and we can make some clusters and target them. And we have a list of where we want to be and when we want to be there. And of course, we have the contact of at least one person on each of each hospital. So um, 
when we say 15, it's because we know how fast can we go. Uh, we learned a lot during the last years about how can we do it like in the more efficient way. And now, as, and as we mentioned, our brand of awareness has been improved. All these negotiations, uh, like time periods have been decreasing. So according to our strategy and according our uh, kind of business model, 15 is a, is a conservative projection. Very exciting. Anything to, we're going to wrap up here. Anything that I didn't get to that you guys wanted to make sure to mention? And then I'll conclude with a final question. We are looking to build the largest and most professional uh, veterinary ecosystem in Latin America, right? And, and that's sort of our goal that I guess we never talked about, but we want to build a veterinary ecosystem across Latin America, which involves having a large hospital network with very good medicine, but then also be part of everything that surrounds that. You know, that there's a lot of other uh, complementary, I guess, businesses and things that you can later build on and be part of, I guess, the Custom, the pet owner journey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that's what we're looking for, right? Well, I will say that a lot of people who are doing acquisition ETA will, will say something similar, that they, they can env envision all of the adjacent opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think that these ETA journeys have to be really mature for that actually to come to fruition. Because if you just, you there are so many clinics <laughs> to acquire. Yeah. If you just focus on that, it could take you years and years and years. And that, and that is not to minimize what you just said about adjacent opportunities or building an ecosystem. It's a compliment. It, it just goes to show how deep this opportunity is, how much, how mm -hmm. much, how rich it is just, do, just, buying clinics, let alone whatever kind of ecosystem adjacent stuff you might want to do at some later date. Good. Yeah. Um, well, I guess the last question uh, is, now that you're doing this, you're, you're doing a, a consolidation in Chile. Is it one of these where you look around at all the businesses that you're, you're, you know, you're walking down the street in Santiago and you're like, that industry would be great for consolidation. That industry would be great for consolidation sort of thing. Oh, uh, let me answer um, this one. Let me answer this one. So, so, so please, please do Diego and just, and, and answer it from the perspective of somebody listening who may not be from the U S and who may be in their native market, doesn't have PE all over the place. And every industry has been looked at by PE. It's, it's a green field, virgin territory. Um, answer and talk to those people, please, Diego. Just going to say that half of our conversation are about boring businesses. We talk about <laughs> this all the time. We move through Santiago using Uber and all the time we're like, look at this kind of car maintenance company. Oh, boring business. Okay. Boring business. We are all the time looking for any, any kind, any kind of business, like we go to buy a sandwich of like, okay, restaurants consolidation. We go to like, like to kind of, you can't imagine because I, that's why I started laughing because we talk about this all the time. The opportunities here are like huge. And I don't want to say more because we want to take those opportunities, but, um, but definitely there are like plenty, plenty of companies or industry here where you can get into doing ETA, not only as a consolidator, but also kind of a search fund or like just a, like a poor player, ETA entrepreneur. And, and so you don't believe that there is something specific to the veterinarian, the, the veterinary clinic industry that made it more ripe for this opportunity. You might have been able to choose yeah, th other ones. Th there is one thing. Of course, you have a trend that it's, it's a growing trend. Y you know that like during the last five years because of COVID and like yeah. pet humanization, the number of pets, in, in, not only Chile, but worldwide 
like increase a lot. And also people perceive their pets like you can't say now that you are a pet owner, you're a pet parent. And mm. like it implies that people are having less kid. The childhood rate has been decreasing and the like pet parenthood rate or cat parenthood rate has been increasing and the willingness to pay for those services has been increasing too. So you have a growing industry, you have also a fragmented industry, which is like a lot of veterinary hospitals, like just single players. And then you have a, like a great opportunity to develop ETA or a boring business strategy. And I, I would say that there are not so many industries like this with this kind of resilient, like growth uh, here in, in, in Latin America. Yeah, well, certainly that, that's a great point. Of course, the pet space is, is notorious for how much, how much it just, it, it's unstoppable what, what consumers are paying for their pets. And that trend, I think, is now 20 years old, but it accelerated even beyond what people thought it could during COVID. So yeah, tailwinds there. Uh, good, good to pick an industry with great tailwinds. Francisco, you want to get in on that question? Well, yeah, I would say it's, it's pretty much my state of mind, to put in a way, consolidation. Yeah, it's very much as you mentioned. Now you walk down the street and you, just by going into this, and be, before this, obviously the veterinary industry was unknown for us, right? And now you walk down the street and now you see, ah, if the veterinary industry is poorly managed and has this, 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 and all, all these other th uh, things and room for improvement, you say, ah, maybe the bakery down the street has the same issues, right? Or the meat store or, or the laundromat or this and that. So I'm constantly thinking about that uh, and thinking, okay, hopefully we can make this work so then we can also start doing this in other in other industries but uh yeah it's definitely top of mind for us right now once we got into this consolidation business yeah well one at a time guys yeah. get the model do the model uh at latam vet make it a success and then and then turn your yeah. attention to others exactly exactly well very interesting congratulations on such a such an entrepreneurial venture and entrepreneurial roll up. I think it's super cool. I love Thank you. that, you know, I know where I know Chile so well where you're doing it. Uh, and we'll have to hear from you in a year to see how, if you got to 15 and beyond. Uh, so yeah, hopefully in person when you visit. Huh? Well, I may have a trip uh, down there coming up. So uh, we'll, uh, I will take you up on that, guys, we'll have to yeah. get, get a drink somewhere. Um, how can people reach out to you if they have questions? What, what do you prefer email LinkedIn? Um, email, email is fine for me. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. For me we'll too. include your emails there. Okay. Franca Francisco Del Rio, Diego Silva. Thank you very much guys for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Will. Will. And thank you for your podcast. I listen every time I go for a run. So like your voice is connected with sport to me. So yeah, <laughs> it, it's a healthy, it's a healthy voice. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Good. Well, I appreciate you, you saying that, Diego. Thank you. Thank you for okay. having us. Thanks, guys. Very, very yes. fun conversation. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Make sure you subscribe to the Acquiring Minds channel below. We are now publishing twice a week. So tons of new interviews and stories to come. Stories that will help you along your own path to acquiring a business.